Hello everyone, Big Italy 42 here once again with Josh Shepardson at BeachAd50 and we are here bringing you the daily fantasy whiff. We're going to be talking about some pitchers to target and that means playing them on your rosters, that means targeting with hitters. Both sides of the barrel here, we're going to be going, talking everything about tonight's slate and trying to give you your best, your best guide for the arms you want and the stacks you want with your hitters. So you ready to kick things off here, Josh? You know it. All right. We're going to be talking FanDuel and DraftKings here, of course, and giving you, like I said, the best of the best. So we're going to start at the top here with starting pitchers, and we're just going to go. I'm going to name some guys that I consider not locks. There's no such thing really as a lock, but the guys that I'm targeting the most. And then if you've got more guys, add those guys. If not, if you've got a rebuttal, a guy that you don't like, tell me that as well. All right. Sounds good to me. Cool. Of course, Clayton Kershaw. Play Clayton Kershaw. No hitters. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, you're not you're not using hitters against Clayton Kershaw. Kershaw, I like him better at DK, where you can pair him with a cheaper starting pitcher. But um, you got to get at least a few shares at FanDuel as well. So Kershaw, fade the hitters, target the pitcher. Yeah, completely agree there. And next up, we have Madison Bumgarner, who I am not touching anyone against either. I am playing Madison Bumgarner. Six run total in this one, so obviously Vegas agrees with us here. Vegas says play both sides of this one and avoid the hitters. So pretty simple outside of a guy like Joe Panic that we had mentioned on the, the earlier podcast. He's a nice, nice filler for your cash games, especially if you're playing on FanDuel where he's just $2,400. But outside of that, it's pitchers and nothing else for me. Yeah, and that Giants game, I mean, that six total, lowest total on the board tonight, you're going to want to get shares of Bumgarner. Uh, he's $1,500 cheaper than Kershaw on DraftKings. Going to give you a little bit of wiggle room on the lineups. So he's a pitcher to target and a pitcher to avoid if you're, if you're looking at hitters. Yep, completely agree there. Next up, we've got Cole Hamels, who is $10,200 on DraftKings, $9,700 on FanDuel. And I'm not going out of my way to target Cole Hamels, but I'm also not going out of my way to roster him because I do prefer, obviously, the two more expensive guys. And there's not that much of a difference between Cole Hamels to Madison Bumgarner. So unless you're trying to go contrarian in a GPP, I'm not going to be playing much Cole Hamels. I mean, it's it's not a great matchup for him, and you don't expect he's going to get a ton of run support with that weak offense behind him. And, yeah, as the third highest price starter at both FanDuel and DraftKings, you're ponying up for a guy who's a betting underdog. Not something I like to do, especially not in cash games where you really need that win at FanDuel. Um, obviously, it's helpful at DraftKings. Unless you're going contrary, and as you said, probably not going to use him. Uh, there's also a few hitters. Well, there's at least a hitter that I like in that ball game to target against Cole Hamels, and that's Ryan Zimmerman. First base eligible at, at FanDuel. Third base and outfield eligible at DraftKings. And he's the type of hitter that can actually do damage. So if I'm using Ryan Zimmerman, on lineups. I certainly don't want to use them in the same lineups as Hamels. And you need to get that roster saving somewhere with your hitters to own guys like Kershaw and Bumgarner who we're already highlighting. So I just think that the way that the lineups are, are shaking out for me, I just can't see myself owning Hamels tonight. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, and that's a great point, especially on Fandle with the win being so heavily weighted. You really need to have pitchers in good spots. And if you're paying up for a pitcher who's an underdog, you're already setting yourself at a disadvantage for those four points for the win. So Really important to keep that in, in consideration there. And when you're looking at DraftKings, obviously you've got two pitchers, so a lot of different ways you can go there. But still, if you're paying $10,000 for a pitcher, I want him to be a favorite. And you like the fact that he's at home, but, I mean, a lot of factors going against him. One thing going for him, he does have a nice strikeout rate, third highest on the day last of pitchers from last season, 23.9%. But at the same time, I mean, I, I think there's better options, and I think you agree there. Same here, yep. All right, um, James Shields, already kind of touched on him. Low total, really not a lot of guys that want to target from the other side. This one, uh, he's a nice uh, a nice swerve, but not a lot of strikeout upside with him. Right, right above league average at 19.2%. Yeah, and uh, I, I consider him a much better play at DraftKings where you have to roster two pitchers than FanDuel. He is, again, a betting underdog like Hamill, so I, I'm not targeting a top-five pitcher at FanDuel where the win is weighted so heavily if they're not a betting favorite. It's just I, I just don't see the value in it, uh, especially, as you noted, strikeout upside is well below that of Kershaw, Bumgarner, and Hamels, the trio of, of lefties in front of him, and uh, even a few arms behind him have similar or higher strikeout out 
potential. So I'm going to pass on Shields in FanDuel games, but I am going to use him uh, maybe, as as we talked about on the podcast earlier, the DraftKings one, uh, pairing of Bumgarner and Shields gives you a nice, very, very high floor. Also gives you a fairly decent ceiling. I mean, you look at a betting total of six, you got two pitchers who they throw up zeros, they limit base runners. You're going to get yourself a very nice foundation and points scored with that duo. Yeah, and both offenses really stagnant right now to start the season. Neither one really putting up runs. I mean, Giants had the one game where they put up a, a nice number. But outside of that, I mean, it's been zeros across the board for the most part for these teams. So obviously Vegas knows that, and that's why it's such a low total. So I got to love Petco Park, too. Yeah, absolutely love Petco. I feel like I could pitch in Petco. In, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not a gym, but I, I feel like I could get a quality start there. Maybe I maybe hit 70 on the gun. Maybe Maybe once. <laughs> Eric Stoltz did it, so hey. I mean, yeah, that's true. If Eric Stoltz can make a career there, at least let me try out. Give me a spring training invite. Uh, next up, Doug Fister, the guy that you you love to hate in GPPs, but you love to love in cash games. Very limited upside as far as strikeouts go, fourteen point eight percent. But among the league leaders in walks allowed, and by that I mean the least number of walks allowed over his career, a three point six percent walk rate, which is even better than Clayton Kershaw. I mean, just the guy just does not give up free passes. Um, he's a he's a solid ground ball pitcher. I mean, he keeps he's a contact guy though. So you know, forty eight point nine percent ground ball rate is solid for him. He's a guy that wants you to hit the ball. Does a good job keeping it on the ground. Doesn't give up a lot of home runs. Doesn't give up a lot of walks. But also not a lot of strikeouts. So he's a low risk, medium reward type of guy if he eats up some innings innings for you. Yeah, I, I I will add that he is my preferred pitching partner for Clayton Kershaw at DraftKings with a price tag of seventy eight hundred dollars. Pairs nicely with Kershaw's twelve thousand three hundred dollar price tag. I actually like him a lot. He's he's also my favorite cash games pick at FanDuel. Slight betting favorite, even though he's facing Cole Hamels. Low total ground ball rate's going to help him navigate Citizens Bank Park, which has a very high home run uh, park factor. But if he keeps the ball on the ground as he usually does, then you can't hit the ball out of the yard if you don't hit it in the air. And uh, he has the goods to, to, to limit the damage. We saw that Geo's problem last night was, was issuing walks. He really only started to struggle when his com- command and control failed him. Fister will have no problems. He's amongst the, the best pitchers in terms of control in the league. So I like Fister tonight quite a bit. I might even use him in a few GPPs, uh, even with the limited strikeout upside at FanDuel, because that win is just so important. And the, the dollar savings that he awards you uh, compared to Kershaw and Bumgarner and Hamels is is so great that you can really get uh, sink your teeth into some of that Coors Field action where because FanDuel doesn't have the expensive pricing on that game you can really load up on some of those hitters take advantage of that high total and still probably come out with a W with with Fister yeah and I'm with you there on all aspects I think Fister will probably end up being my highest owned pitcher and for those same reasons I mean, he gives he gives you a nice safe floor and knock on wood here he's probably one of the least likely to just get shelled. I mean, if he has a bad outing, it's usually going to be three runs, five innings kind of thing, and uh, won't kill you but won't do a whole lot for you. So you got to like that high floor with him. Um, Next up, I want to talk to you about a guy that I'm not a big fan of, doesn't have a high strikeout rate, but he is going to get some run support today, opposing Jeremy Guthrie. you got Jared Weaver, just a 19% strikeout rate, which is right about league average. But Kansas City struck out the least times of least number of times of any team in the majors last year. So really further limiting his upside there tonight. Jared Weaver in a good spot for the win, but that's about it. So GPP only for me, but say you had a hundred lineups, which I, I doubt that you do. Most people don't. <laughs> but say you had a hundred lineups you're playing on FanDuel and GPPs, how many shares of Jared Weaver would you have tonight? Uh I would say 10 or fewer um, because I, I, looking at he and Fister, my preference is ever so slightly for Fister. He's only $100 more. He's facing a lesser lineup. I think if you're going to go with that that um, a, approach of I'm going to chase the win, I'm going to take a betting favorite. Weaver is a bigger betting favorite, but he's also more likely to seed runs because the Kansas City Royals lineup is better than that of the Phillies. So I would take Fister as opposed to Weaver. I think both are strong SP2s in, in games at DraftKings. Again, though, Fister's actually $200 cheaper than Weaver, so I'm going to be in on Fister more than I'm in on Weaver. Still going to get some shares, not going to get a ton of them. And uh, like Fister... Looking at Weaver and a few GPPs just so that I can go hitter heavy 
but that's really the only reason to grab him. You're not expecting a high floor. You're hoping for a W, maybe a handful of punch outs, and uh, some some good luck on on fly balls. I mean, the one nice thing about that Royals lineup is um, they don't possess a lot of power. Weaver's a fly ball pitcher, so if he's yielding these fly balls and they manage to stay in the ballpark, could end up with a pretty nifty line from him. But not a guy that I love, but a guy that I like enough that I do need to get some shares tonight. Yeah, and that's a really great point with him about the fly ball rate. I mean, by far the highest on the night. It was like 47.9% last year. So, I mean, concerning, yes, but also in a pitcher's park. And like you said, not a lot of power in that lineup. So not terribly concerning, but... Few shares, but not a lot for me either. And next guy, I will have zero shares of. I do think he gets rocked. We mentioned his woe bug against left-handed batters. 364 last year. Just absolutely embarrassing. I mean, get it together, Jeremy Guthrie, because I will not be playing you in any of my games tonight. Yeah, I can't use Guthrie at all. He He's a huge betting underdog. He's a great guy to target uh, in terms of hitters. Get your lefties ready. Get your Cole Calhouns, your Eric Ibars. Good candidate to stack against because he's not exactly exceptional against right-handed batters either. And, and Trout's just so phenomenal anyway. If you can get a Cole, Cole Calhoun, uh, Mike Trout, uh, Albert Pujols, one through three, maybe a wraparound depending on who's hitting at the bottom of the order for the Angels tonight. You could do something like an eight through two stack with with uh, Trout, save some money. That is, a, that is a stack target for me. I want to go after Jeremy Guthrie, and I definitely, at the least, will be using Eric Ibar and Cole Calhoun very heavily. Uh, not near each other in the lineup, which does stink. Ibar's going to hit six. Calhoun's going to hit leadoff. But both are priced to own on both uh, DraftKings and FanDuel, and you got to love targeting uh, Jeremy Guthrie like that. Yeah, I'm with you, though. This is the, the first starting pitcher I'm going out of my way to stack as we're going down the list and uh yeah i'm with you there all those lefties especially in play cole calhoun's got a really great price at FanDuel at just thirty five hundred dollars tonight so guy with some some significant upside and it doesn't hurt having the best hitter in baseball right behind you either definitely before we get too far i, I want to get to a name that i think we accidentally skipped over and that's julio Terran yep. of the uh of the braves he is the last of the really good arms that I like. Um, he is a slight betting favorite despite being backed by uh, a poor Braves offense that obviously they're off to an electric start that nobody saw coming, but let's be realistic. We're, we're just a handful of games into the season. Um, thankfully, it's a really low betting total, and he's opposing basically Joe Average, as we talked about on the uh, earlier pod, Dylan G here. So he should get a little bit of run support. He shouldn't need a lot against that Mets lineup. Really, the only name that scares me facing right-handed pitching in that lineup is Lucas Duda. Uh, David Wright is great against lefties, eh, pretty good against righties, but um, I I'm not terribly scared of that lineup. I like Tehran. Uh I don't like him more... Uh, at Let's put it this way. If I'm choosing between him and Shields as my SP2 to pair with Bumgarner, I'm still going to take Shields. I like the ballpark factor better. I'm willing to sacrifice the the higher probability of a win uh, based on the fact that that I just don't know how much greater that, that chance of a win is for, for Tehran. He's just not backed by a good offense. But in GPPs, that's a really good guy to target. Big swinging strike rate, uh, as you'll find out in, in – uh, my uh, salary exploitation piece that's going to be going up today. Uh, he, he ranked among uh, the league leaders last year in swinging strike rate, according to Fangraph. So there is some strikeout upside there that goes beyond what his strikeout rate is. I think you see that go up this year. Yeah, yeah, and I like that call. And uh, the to be devil's advocate here, the one thing going against Tehran, not not much of a factor in this ballpark, but uh, his fly ball rate is a lot higher than you'd like it to be, yes. 43.8%, but you already kind of touched on that. Obviously, Lucas Duda, the one guy you're really, really concerned with with a ton of power against righties, but I mean, the other big bat, David Wright, you mentioned, much better against lefties, which is why we played him last night, not so much today. The rest of that lineup is just, it's it's god-awful, to be honest, and uh, <laughs> I mean, you could always worry about a leadoff homer maybe from Curtis Granderson, but that's, that's not something I'm ever going to be chasing. Yeah. Yeah, not, not at this point in time. And that brings us to some solid gold that you have with Jason Hamlin. I know this is going to sound crazy in Coors Field, but if there is ever the ultimate contrarian play in a GPP, it is any pitcher ever in any scenario at Coors Field. So what do you got for us here, Josh? Well, for starters, I like his price point at DraftKings a lot better than at FanDuel. At 8100 I mean, this is a true contrarian pick. Uh, he's not priced that far below some of the other names, so I'm 
Might use him in a GPP or two if I'm feeling super crazy, but uh, I really like the pairing of him and Kershaw in, in, a, in a tournament or two at, uh, at DraftKings. Uh, basically, I, I, I referenced this the last year plus. A great piece up at Baseball Prospectus that is not behind their paywall. It is free. It's a Baseball Pro Guestus piece. They had a guest, Dan Rosenson, uh, who I believe was a uh, intern there, but Regardless, Dan Rosenson wrote a great piece talking about which ty pitch types work best at Coors Field. It broke down uh, the difference between batting average and ISO, among other things, uh, between Coors Field and a neutral ballpark. And basically, the long and short of it is, if you're a pitcher that throws four-seam fastballs and sliders primarily, you're not going to be hurt as bad as a pitcher who relies on a sinker, who relies on a curveball, who relies on a changeup, or even a cutter. Um, just to kind of put some numbers in perspective, uh, fastball and uh, forcing fastball in a neutral MLB park has a 174 ISO. Now, this this study, just to, to give you a time frame, this was published in 2013, April 2013, so it's only two years old. Probably not a lot has changed since then. Uh, forcing fastball, 174 ISO at uh, neutral ballpark, 199 at, at, at um, Coors Field. 0 0.025 ISO increase compared to the sinker, which is a 150 ISO, 193 at Coors Field. Uh, that, that ISO is almost identical to the four-seam fastball, 0 0.043 uptick. Uh, Hamill throws both a four-seamer and a sinker. I would expect him to lean on the four-seamer a little bit more today. Maybe he'll throw the sinker if he gets a base runner, uh, try and induce a double play. Not a bad thing to have in his pocket, but not something that he needs to rely on. What I love is the fact that his his primary breaking ball is a slider. 126 ISO allowed in an MLB neutral park. 152 at Coors, just a 0 0.026 uptick in, in ISO allowed compared to a 0 0.053 uptick on curveballs. More than twice the ISO uptick if you're a curveball pitcher at Coors Field. Changeup gets hammered even harder. 0 0.078 uptick in ISO from 144 at a neutral park to 222 at Coors Field. That is a huge uh, red flag. If you're a pitcher that relies on changeups, you don't want to use him there. Hamill rarely throws his changeup. Uh, Cutter, 144 ISO MLB Neutral Park, 210 ISO at Coors Field, 0 .066 uptick. Again, not a big cutter pitcher. Looking at his uh, Brooks baseball player card, last year he threw four-seam fastballs 34.05% of the time, sinker 24.78% of the time, slider a whopping 31.77% of the time. So we got a nice profile there. 65 66 plus percent of his pitches last year were four seam fastballs and sliders. That is the profile you're looking for at Coors Field. So if you want a contrarian pick, go with the guy who succeeded with the Cubs, which we haven't even gotten to. Last year, before being traded from from Chicago to Oakland, averaged uh, had a strikeout rate of 24.2 percent and just a 5.4 percent walk rate with the Cubs, compared to 18.9 percent and 7.3 percent respectively with the Athletics. So much better, very comfortable with the Cubs. I, I really think that they're, uh, I mean, I, it's tough to bet on anybody who's uh, pitching in a game with a 10 total at Coors Field, but if you're ever going to do it, Jason Hamill looks like a pretty nifty guy to do it with. Yeah, and you can rest assured that he's going to be very low owned. I mean, on a nine game slate, I would say absolute highest case scenario you're going to see him in a GPP would be eight or nine percent. I mean, probably even significantly lower than that. So, I absolutely love that. I mean, it, if that pays off, it's going to pay off in a big way. Obviously, a lot of people are going to be paying up for those Colorado bets would be the most popular in the tournament. So just imagine the, the swing you would get if all the Colorado bets are the highest on, which they should be, especially on FanDuel, where they're, uh, they're much easier to fit into your lineups. And then you get one of the lowest owned pitchers. If he mows them down, that's a monstrous advantage over the GPP field. And kind of, uh, I mean, obviously this comes with the caveat that he could get rocked. That's that's just what happens at Coors Field. And uh, to, to, to take an example from earlier in the podcast, you asked how many times I would roster Jared Weaver uh, if I played 100 uh, GPPs. I'm going to say about the same number with Hamill, about 10%. If I'm playing GPPs, probably going to use him in 8 to 10% of, of those Um Maybe a little bit more at DraftKings because of the uh, the dollar savings that you're going to get with him as an SP2. That's that's either going to look brilliant or it's going to look foolish. But remember, Kyle Kendrick pitched a, a, a gem at Miller Park. Just look at what that did for people who uh, went on a limb and, and drafted him on opening day. I mean, that is your your poster child for what it can mean to separate yourself from the pack. 
by rolling the dice with a contrarian pick like uh, Jason Hamill. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you're taking a shot at GPP like this, throw it in a two dollar, a five dollar GPP. Worst yeah. case scenario, you lose a few bucks. Base, best case scenario, you make everyone else, including us, in GPPs and most lineups look like fools. So, I mean, that, that's a chance you're willing to take. Obviously, if you're playing single double, single bullet, two entries, you're, it's not a way you're going to go. But multiple entries, I mean, absolutely. Take yourself a shot for a few bucks. Why not? I mean, it could pay off a big way for you. Next up, Giovanni Gallardo over here. He's $7,600 facing Houston at uh, FanDuel. His DraftKings price is, I lost it over here. $7,000. I got your back. All right, thank you. $7,000 even. And Gallardo, a guy that uh, doesn't strike out a lot of batters anymore, right at league average, 17.9%. He's got a great ground ball rate at 50.8% last year. That's been his uh, his bread and butter throughout his career. And facing a Texas, or I'm sorry, a Houston team who has been striking out in loads like they did the last year. They've been off to a great start this year, fixing that uh, those strikeout problems. <laughs> not. Anyway, they're striking out at a huge clip right now, and he's in a good spot, but not a high strikeout pitcher. So something's got to give here. He doesn't strike out a lot of batters. They strike out a ton. I don't think he's a great option for GPPs only because he is a contact pitter, pitcher, but he does keep the ball on the ground. But I do think you could do worse than having him in a couple of your GPP lineups tonight. What do you think about that? I think he's a, a, a strong GPP target based on the fact that that strikeout rate might get that uptick from the boomer bust Rangers lineup. But he's kind of in that Jason Hamill boat of if these guys are making contact, eh. It's it's a dicey situation because that lineup is loaded with power. Um, pitch to contact pitchers are probably going to have some issues with the, with the Astros this year. Maybe he tweaks his uh, pitch mix today to take advantage of uh, some empty swings. Maybe see him rely on his curveball a little bit more. Um, he'd be wise to do that. I will have some shares. Uh, he's probably he's getting near that that cut point for uh, pitchers that I would consider using. Only one more that I'm looking at uh, that that I I would give some some usage too but Gallardo not a guy that you need to go bending over backwards to roster but a guy that that's an okay pick in in, in uh, GPPs yeah I'm with you there and I think I know where you're going with your final pick it's the guy that uh you called Joe Average earlier Dylan yep. G he's sitting here at $6,500 on FanDuel he's got a nice price on DraftKings as well at just $6,800 so we kind of talked about it a little bit on the podcast but I'm gonna let you take the floor here again I mean he's a guy that's not gonna kill you but he's not a guy that's gonna blow you away either so what, what's your take on dylan g here today my take is you're basically banking on the atlanta braves lineup realizing that they're the atlanta braves lineup i mean these guys have been overperforming early this year there's not a lot of thump in the lineup there's some swing and miss in the lineup um some of the guys that do make contact just don't have have much uh sting in, in the bat so i'm basically rolling the dice with average playing up above average tonight based on opponent more than anything. We got a low betting total in this game. And uh, as we noted, talking about Tehran, Tehran, despite being a, a just a very good pitcher, uh, only a slight betting favorite. And that basically should tell you what you need to know about the Braves offense. Vegas doesn't like uh, putting up uh, a big minus sign next to Tehran. Because he's not going to get run support. It's very unlikely he's going to get much run support. Even if G doesn't come out with a W, at his price tag, if he can give you six, seven innings and a quality start, that's going to give you enough money to spend heavily on hitters elsewhere to, to prop up that number. And uh, I just don't see a lot of blow-up potential with Dylan G. So a guy that might have a, a higher floor than somebody priced uh, – that, that you'd expect for somebody priced the way that G is. So I'm going to roll with G in a few GPPs. Not a huge fan of him in, in, in cash games, obviously, because he's not a betting favorite, uh, limited ceiling, and you're really looking for security in cash games. But in GPPs, he's he's probably, um, I, I would I would put him up there as probably my favorite cheap, like dirt cheap bargain basement uh, pitcher. Yeah, and that's a really great point that you made about the Las Vegas lines. I mean, obviously... You know, in a vacuum, you're looking at Dylan G versus Julio Tehran, and it doesn't make any sense. You're thinking, you know, Tehran, obviously, an additional tier, maybe two tiers above Dylan G as far as talent goes and stuff, like pure, pure stuff. But at the same time, I mean, you got to take into account, like you said, the bad lineups, the fact that he's not going to get a whole lot of run support, and that kind of levels the ground there for you, not only in Vegas, but uh, in your GPPs as well. It gives him a little, little added incentive to play in there, so... 
Next, we're going to move on to talking about some stacks. Obviously, we're down at the bottom of the barrel here with pitchers. So not really guys that we're going to be wanting to target as far as on the mound, but we want to be targeting the guys that are on the mound with the hitters. So I'm going to give you my favorite stack. You give me uh, agree, disagree, who your favorite stack is. If you agree, we'll move on to the next one, et cetera, all right? Yep, sounds good. All right, my favorite stack is the Dodgers. And if you see the uh, the piece that I wrote today about your, your positional analysis, you'll see that there's Dodgers at most positions. And this is mostly picking on the rookie, the young guy, Archie Bradley, who I talked to you about earlier, a guy who had some trouble with control in the minors. And as we know, a ton of power here with this Dodger lineup. Pretty solid hitters top to bottom. Adrian Gonzalez, the hottest hitter in the entire universe right now. 11 for 16 with two walks so far. Obviously not going to continue to hit over 600 this year. But, I mean, at this at this rate, he's sitting at $4,600 on DraftKings. Great price from there. 53 on FanDuel. And if I'm stacking a team, it's going to be the Dodgers. Yeah, that, that's my favorite stack as well. It's probably going to be a popular stack tonight. Uh, don't be deceived by the 7.5 betting total on the game. Uh, the individual team breakdown uh, of betting total that Pinnacle Sports has has the, uh, the Diamondbacks total at just 3 and the Dodgers total at 4.5. 4.5. And and so obviously Vegas is, is, is in our camp on get your Dodgers in your lineup. Uh, they're Probably the most reasonably priced stack as well. I mean, uh, outside of rostering the likes of the formerly the artist formerly known as Fausto Carmona and uh, something like Kyle Kendrick or Archie Bradley, you simply cannot stack Rockies at, at DraftKings. You can't do it. You have to um, basically sacrifice pitching and, and hope that that one of these guys has a four leaf clover in their uh, back pocket. Uh, Otherwise, like it's just not doable. Um, so, in terms of stacking, I'm with you. I like the Dodgers. I like the matchup. Uh, love Archie Bradley long term, first start, and just uh, the control issues would worry me if I if I'm a Diamondbacks fan. Yeah, I mean, all it's going to take is a couple free passes, one long bomb, and you've already got yourself a nice start there. So, like that stack a lot. As far as other stacks, um, we've already mentioned the Angels. I don't think we need to go much more into that, nope. especially the lefties. Mike Trout, go ahead and do that next. Um, Rockies, don't need to tell you about that. That's an obvious stack here. And you're obviously avoiding teams like Arizona against Clayton Kershaw. I mean, if you want to do that, that there's a difference between being contrary to the tournament <laughs> and throwing your money in the trash. And even if Kershaw goes and gives up four runs today, it's four solo home runs, which would literally be the end of the world in Armageddon, if you ask me. Go ahead and send me the hate mail. Find me on Twitter. Don't care. I will never stack anyone against Clayton Kershaw because I value my money and I don't want to set it on fire. So... With that being said, there's not a whole lot of other options. You don't really want to stack San Francisco or San Diego in Petco. Um, so I'm going to go out here and I'm going to tell you my next stack, which is obviously a little bit off the wall. I'm going to be going with the Toronto Blue Jays against Ubaldo Jimenez. Obviously, we know a ton of power there. Jimenez, one of, I believe he was actually the worst in the league at uh, walk rate last year, 13.9% among qualified pitchers. I mean, absolutely ridiculous that he is still getting time, but that tells you the state of the the bottom of that rotation for the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, the guy struggles with walks. Not terrible in all other aspects, but not very good against lefties or righties. You've got your guys, Jose Bautista. We expect he's going to be back today. Edwin Encarnacion. I mean, name whoever you'd like. I love this stack today. I do too, and one beauty of this stack is you're getting shortstop filled with an above average hitter like yeah. Jose Reyes. Um, it, you don't usually get that because shortstop is yes because shortstop is such a crummy position um usually they're your down order hitters and you're not stacking down order so when you get a guy like jose reyes leading off um he's one of the few hitters that actually gets the favorable platoon side of ubaldo jimenez but jimenez is bad against right-handed batters too and uh both edwin encarnacion jose bautista well above average hitters against right-handed and left-handed pitchers uh josh donaldson also very good against right-handed pitchers Jo uh, Russell Martin priced favorably at FanDuel, so he's another guy at a position that, that lacks a lot of offensive star power. So you're filling another um, hard-to-fill position in your stack if you're going one through four or two through five. Um, you, you've got some options there. And the other thing is is they're all very patient hitters, which is going to play right into their uh, – Ubaldo Jimenez's control is just going to play right into their hand. I'd expect uh, some, some fireworks there, and so does Vegas. I mean, it's one of the higher betting totals today. So I want a piece of Ubaldo Jimenez. Stack against him looks pretty good. 
Yeah, and there's a guy I want to make sure that you include. I'm assuming he's going to be in the lineup. Lefty Specialist. And this is a guy that always kind of goes under the radar. And especially if you're stacking this game, Danny Valencia. Not a ton of power, but a 143 ISO. This is above average against lefties, but last year had a 366 Woba against lefties. So I know he's the guy that you and I talked about last year. We did some podcasts and some things like that together. And he's he's a lefty specialist. So you assume he's going to be in lineup. Should have a nice lineup spot, I would assume, as well today. So if you're stacking the Blue Jays, I'm going to make sure that I include Danny Valencia because he's a hell of a hitter against lefties. Justin, I, I, I hate to do this to you, but I, I'm... I'm going to blame the sleep deprivation from your big cash last night on this. Ubaldo Fan is right-handed, so we're not going to want to use Danny Valencia today. That is definitely the sleep deprivation. <laughs> I'm behind it, it on that happens. one. It happens. Right. But uh, I still love the Blue Jay stack. Let's yeah. let's roll with that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we'll pretend that Danny Valencia is, is uh, still one of our favorite players, just not today. <laughs> yeah, that that's going to be actually just a, a preview into the future. So my apologies on that one. But Danny Valencia against the lefty. Play him next time. Yes, the yes. Lefty. Um, any other stacks that you really like on this this slate? I mean, we already kind of knocked a bunch out that we like, avoided a couple. Is there any any other one you like off the wall here? Um, I, I like the I like the Orioles and the other side of that game. Uh, Alejandro Deaza, a left-handed batter who hits right-handed pitching much better. Sanchez has had some control issues as a starter in the upper minors. Was brilliant in the bullpen last year, but I'm skeptical that he's going to have success immediately as a starter again. So I want to get him. I like. Uh, in that game, I like Travis Snyder. Uh, Chris Davis gives you some GPP upside. Hitting a little lower in the lineups, so you'd have to do something like a 2-5 through five stack. Uh, Manny Machado, 0 for the season, but above average hitter at third base. He's going to snap out of it at some point. Uh, as I said in the earlier podcast, if this were any other time in the season, it would be a non-thought. Like, it would be a non-issue. Um, You've also got Steve Pierce, who's better against lefties than righties. But if you're going to stack, you you got to do it right. You got to get your two hitter in there. Uh, Adam Jones, one of the better outfielders in the game, can hit righties and lefties alike. So that's a stack that I'm looking at. Looking at the rest of the games, uh, maybe you get some Rangers in there against Roberto Hernandez. Not so sure that I'd do a full blown stack. Like some lefties, like Prince Fielder, like Runad Odor, uh, down order. But uh, Shinsu Chu was hurt the other day. Don't know if he'll be back yet. So I, I'm not seeing a lot of other stacks. I mean, I, obviously we touched on the Cubs um, looking at Kyle Kendrick, but it's just too pricey to do that at DraftKings. And uh, guys like Vance Worley keeps the ball on the ground. Don't uh, Not enough left-handed batters that, that I want to stack against him. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jimmy Nelson, he's a guy that I think people might mistakenly stack against. Um, didn't have a great ERA last year, but ERA estimators like Jimmy Nelson a little bit. Good prospect. Do expect him to be pretty decent. So while he's not a player you need to go out of your way to avoid, not a player that I'm going to go out of my way to target. Yeah, I'm with you there. And uh, on the, the Rangers stack, like you had mentioned, the wraparound stack, that might be a nice time for you there, especially if Odor's batting around 8th or ninth, like he has been recently. Obviously, Chu, we'll, we'll see his status in a little bit here. But I like that wraparound stack with him, and they're going to be pretty cheap. I mean, Fielder... And Beltre, I mean, the only guys you're really paying for there. So it should yep. be a nice cheap stack. You can maybe even get yourself some Rockies in there. So I'm just we're just trying to help you get Rockies in your lineup. <laughs> All right, with that, that's going to wrap things up for us here. Thanks for hanging out with us. We have a ton of great content on DailyFantasyCafe.com today. Got everything covered for tonight's slate. And we will see you guys again on the next podcast.